Hello, this is Angela with Parkers Permaculture. It's a lovely overcast afternoon here in Portland, Oregon. Um, please forgive my stained hands. I was picking mulberries right before I sat down to film this video. So I did a video the other day on some spiffing up of my front yard bed right up against the street. And I commented in that video about plum suckers and I got some questions uh, about plants, trees, shrubs that sucker in your garden and what's going on and what should you do about it. So I thought I would answer those questions really quickly here and show you around some parts of my permaculture food forest here in zone 8B in Portland, Oregon, and go over some of the plants here that are prone to suckering and what I do about it. So suckers are the um, new growth that a shrub or tree sends up from the base and they start out green and flexible and over time become much more brown and rigid and they can get quite large. They can get to the point where they are an additional trunk on the tree itself, as large as a trunk if they are left um, untended to. And I'll go over in a few minutes why it's important to tend to the suckers that come up on our shrubs and trees if we don't want them. But first let's talk about why suckers are produced in the first place. So when a tree is undergoing stress and perhaps that stress is so significant that it is afraid it's going to die. Perhaps it has a significant pest pressure or it's rotting from the inside um, or uh, it has had some significant trauma and that could be in the form of a fire or um, something falling on the plant. It could be in the form of a really heavy pruning by a human or grazing by an animal. And that stimulates the plant to say, gosh, I really want to survive. And I'm not sure that the core of my plant is going to make it. But along my root system, I can send up new vegetative growth that perhaps can continue to uh, keep going and thrive. And so when a shrub or a tree is under a lot of stress, it can send up suckers quite a ways away from the parent. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and that is a, basically a clone of the parent. It is a um, second chance at life. When it feels that the main trunk of the tree is not going to make it, it can send up a sprout farther down that can hopefully keep going and keep living. So you may wonder, why is there a sprout of my um, plum tree coming up 12 feet away from my plum? And sometimes that's because the plant has been stressed in some way that stimulates a sucker and it can be produced anywhere along along the um, pathways that the roots of that tree uh, take. Now, if you are dealing with grafted trees, those trees are kind of a unique um, way of uh, existing for a tree, right? Obviously it doesn't happen in nature. So with the graft, you have a rootstock grafted to a scion, which is basically a branch and you are asking the branch to function as a trunk instead of a horizontal branch. And um, what you get in that situation is you get the rootstock really trying to take over. And many, many kinds of grafted fruit are this way. The rootstock is trying to um, express its autonomy and it is trying to send up its own green shoots and so you'll often get suckers from the rootstock on grafted fruit and that is not because the grafted portion is exhibiting stress it's just because the rootstock is trying to get the upper hand so those also need to be removed because the rootstock is going to produce fruit that is not the quality that you are expecting that rootstock has been selected for the um disease resistance and resiliency of the root portion of the plant and also it has been selected to um, exhibit a dwarfing habit or a growth habit on the scion itself. So it's not selected for the fruit. So definitely you want to prune that off. You'll often find folks um, encounter a old abandoned farmhouse or an old property that they take over and they have rather unpleasant pears or apples growing and those are often the rootstock pears or apples where the top grafted portion portion has died and all that's left is the rootstock and it gets a chance to just really thrive but the fruit is not particularly tasty so when we get those kinds of suckers we want to take them off as well
The third reason that plants may sucker is because it's a natural way that they uh, proliferate in the landscape and they uh, reproduce themselves in the landscape. Uh, birch trees are an example of this. There's lots and lots of trees that will send up clones of themselves and form a giant colony that essentially is all genetically identical, but it looks like an entire forest. And I have a plant in my front yard, a couple of them actually, that have this behavior. And I'm gonna talk about it when I get up there. So these kinds of trees will send up suckers in the hopes of forming a nice little thicket or um, a nice little collective of genetically identical trees. So you may feel like you're walking in a forest of uh, many, many different trees, but they're actually all clones coming off the same uh, root system and they're all interconnected. I have, again, I'll show you in my front yard, I have an example of this. So let's go look around my garden and I'll show you, um, hopefully my neighbor's dog will stop barking. I will show you some of the examples of suckers that I have right now and talk about why you want to remove them, when you want to remove them, and um, then we'll come back and circle back around here at the end. All right, we are crouched at the base of my quince tree, which you can see is getting quite large. It is 12 years old, I believe. This is a Crimskaya quince, just a beautiful, beautiful tree. It doesn't really fruit heavily and it's gonna need a really hard prune this year, but it just flowers gorgeously in the spring. Now, this is a problem of building soil fertility, building biomass. Over the last 12 years, this graft at the bottom of this tree has gotten buried because I have added several inches of topsoil. We have created several inches of topsoil. And when you bury the graft of the tree, as I said earlier, you often get suckers from the rootstock. Now, I came in here with hand pruners and I just took out all of these suckers. This is not ideal. What you want, I left one here to look at. What you want is to remove the suckers when they're green and supple, and you don't want to get these mounds of this dark, um, more rigid material coming up from the rootstock. So I'm gonna come in here actually with my saw way down at the base and prune these out. And that should help, I hope, keep the suckering to a minimum. Once you let a uh, area of suckers kind of get larger, really proliferate, they can keep coming back and cutting them back can actually stimulate more suckers, particularly, particularly if we're talking about working below the graft of a grafted fruit tree. So there's a look at it right there. That's the problem area. And Again, I don't want a multi-trunked tree and I don't want any fruit being produced by the rootstock because it's not nearly as good. I want the fruit that is selected for, as you can see up here, up here, that has the delicious flavor and aroma. All right, we're up in the front yard of my food forest now. You can see the pawpaw tree here that we had to rig some supports because it's so heavily laden with fruit. It was leaning and I was really worried about branch breakage. So I've got some supports for that. Up here, I have multiple trees that have the potential to sucker. And I thought I would just talk about them quickly. The first one here is this nitrogen fixing purple robe locust, which I pollard. It is here as a uh, nurse tree. It's going to get removed as my pawpaws continue to get a little bit bigger. They will become the dominant canopy tree and this tree will get removed. Now I was warned, please don't plant purple robe locusts. It suckers everywhere. If you damage the roots, it stimulates it to create a sucker. And you can see there's one right here amongst my chop and drop. This is a sucker of a purple robe locust. The good thing is they come up really easily and I just throw them back on the bed where they die. Now, again, this is not a permanent fixture in my landscape, but if you do have locusts growing in your yard, they are highly, highly prone to producing suckers when you damage the roots. So be aware of where you're putting a shovel that it can damage the roots. Now I have read that pollarding the tree like I have been doing here, um, this is a branch I just cut back, pollarding the tree like I've been doing helps reduce the temptation or the habit of producing root suckers for this tree. It's also something you need to be aware of if you put this tree in your landscape and you want to remove it later, that you may end up after you chop down the tree, having to remove suckers for a period of time, potentially years afterward. I was prepared for all of that when I planted this tree. Sometimes when we have suckers, it's a desirable quality. It can be something that we are hoping for. Suckers can be a way that a fruit tree, um, 
helps clone itself, helps produce a clonal patch of trees. And pawpaws are notorious for it. In the wild, you'll often see a group of pawpaws growing along a river's edge or in a dappled understory. And what you have from those pawpaws is actually not a series of pawpaw trees, but one clonal tree. So here is an example. Or my pawpaw, this is a grafted pawpaw, has sent up a sucker. And some folks are frustrated by that and want to remove those. I actually don't. I actually wouldn't mind a whole patch of pawpaws. And with seedling pawpaws and sucker pawpaws from the rootstock, sometimes you can get pretty tasty good pawpaws. So I'm going to see what happens to this. I wouldn't really mind a clump in this guild here, especially as this is going to be get getting removed in the coming years. I wouldn't mind having a clump of pawpaws in with my Juneberry and my Fijoa and my tree collards. So I'm not upset about that. I'm just gonna observe it and see how it fits into my landscape before I decide whether to take out this little sucker. On the other side of this pawpaw here, just love the look of the leaves of this tree. Just such a gorgeous tree. I know I talk it up a lot, but I'm such a fan of this tree. So now we are on the other side. Here's my peach tree, which doesn't sucker at all. And next to it is one of my bush cherries. Now, one of the advantages of bush cherries is that they do sucker. They are not grafted. They are grown on their own roots. And that means this little sucker here, I can take a shovel and sever it where it is being sent up from the parent rootstock. And I can give this to a friend or I can sell it. This will produce fruit that is true to the parent. So this Juliet cherry, its suckers will produce Juliet cherries because they are true from the roots. This is not a grafted plant at all. So having a tree on its own rootstock means your suckers are something that you can intentionally foster and utilize as either a uh, source for a plant nursery where you sell or to uh, propagate and increase the number of this specific plant on your property or share with friends and follow the permaculture ethic of share the surplus. So I will be sharing this with my friend Lyndon because I believe the one I gave her earlier in the year, a deer ate. So I'm glad I have more to share. Now stepping through, here is the bush cherry behind me. I'm going to pan across. This is my Fijoa or one of my Fijoas looking amazing. In front of it is a Juneberry. This is my Carolina Allspice, which suddenly got huge. This plant has not been watered. This plant has gotten huge. It must love the hot weather. I'm really excited about the beautiful, beautiful blossoms on this. I had a TikTok recently showing some of the blossoms on this plant. They're gorgeous, beetle pollinated, really interesting flower. But at the base of this Carolina Allspice is, look at this, a plum sucker. So let's pan up. Here's my plum tree which has grapes going through it. Ooh, that car was going fast. Grapes going through my plum tree. Here are the plums, which are not yet ripe. Tons and tons and tons of them, usually ripe in September. As I said in my video the other day about cleaning up this front yard bed, this is my bed up against the street, the back side of it. Plums sucker pretty darn heavily. And it's something that you really wanna be aware of if you are growing grafted European plums. Again, more grapes. Plum trees make a great trellis for grapes, then you don't have to build a human trellis. Or I should say a human made trellis. So the plum trees tend to sucker and they could sucker. So there's the trunk in here. We are probably, oh, a dozen or 15 feet, probably 15 feet away from the uh, trunk of the tree and we're getting a plum sucker. It's kind of yellow and pale looking because this is a very shady spot right here and uh, it's new and I'm going to be removing that all the way at the ground. Remember I talked about how we want to remove these when they're green and flexible and before they turn brown and woody. So I'm just going to clip that off and this root that's running underneath here um, hopefully will just chill out and not send up any more suckers. But you should be aware for plums you can get suckers anywhere even outside of the canopy zone of the tree. Anywhere those roots are particularly if you damage them but just in general plums are going to sucker be on top of snipping those off. So thanks for hanging out with me today under the quince bush here in my side garden and thanks for walking around with me and looking at some of the examples of suckering that you may find in your garden and that I have to deal with here. It's good 
if we know and understand the habit of our grafted fruit trees, we can go ahead and remove those suckers and get the kind of consistency and quality we want out of our orchards. But perhaps just like I did with my pawpaw, Perhaps you may have some examples of suckering that you just want to leave and see what happens and see if it works into your garden design. If perhaps your fruit tree or your cherry bush cherry or something like that is um, getting a chance to exhibit a little bit more of its natural behavior that it would in the wild. And if you can't leverage that for the betterment of your garden design. So use your powers of observation, use those slow, small solutions in permaculture, be slow to act, m take time to observe and see, does this fit into my landscape or do I need to remove it? If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and click subscribe. You can check out my Patreon down in the description and also my brand new channel, Parka's Hausfrau. I will link to it right now. Thanks.